Um, so it's a real pleasure to welcome um, Stuart Firestein. Fierst now I'm going to screw it up because I asked you how to say it. Stuart Firestein from Columbia University, who's going to talk to us about Replicate That. Please join me in welcoming Stuart. Thank you all. So, first of all, of course, my thanks to the organizers of this uh, wonderful symposium. It's, uh, it's wonderful for me in particular to be invited to this kind of thing. I like conferences anyway, but to be among people who I don't always get to sit in a room with and hear different ideas and different kinds of thinking is really quite exceptional. So um, I've been continuing to work on this presentation because I don't want to just replicate <laughs> what everybody else has said, in particular Richard's talk, which I could easily have just replicated somehow or another. So I continued to change this, so it might be a little disorganized, but, but we'll give it a try. Um, I thought I would give you a little bit of a, a kind of a preamble to uh, give you some ideas of why the hell it is I'm here, actually. And, and this started, really, so um, at Columbia, let's see, uh, I'm a neuroscientist. I run a laboratory. We work on the olfactory system, or the nose, which, as you can see, has been very important all through antiquity. It's the first thing to go, apparently. <laughs> in most statuary. Um, and I run a laboratory there, and I work with graduate students and postdocs, and we think up experiments to imagine uh, how the olfactory system works, kind of molecular discrimination, molecular detection, uh, the mechanisms of it, and then how the brain receives these signals, all devoted, as I'm fond of saying, towards answering that fundamental human question, how do I smell? Which, you know, <laughs> we all need to know. Thank you. So, um, and you know, working in the lab with students and postdocs, thinking up these experiments, is, it gets me in early and keeps me there late, and it's quite, um, I would have to say, exhilarating. I feel quite lucky to have a position like this. I also, at Columbia, uh, uh, have teaching responsibilities, of course, and the main course I teach is called Cellular and Molecular Neuroscience I, a rather imposing sort of course. It's intended for majors and pre-meds and so forth, and uh, consists of my giving some 25 lectures or 23 lectures, fact-filled lectures. We use this textbook called Principles of Neural Science, by these, edited by these three eminent neuroscientists, just to give you an idea. It's, uh, uh, I hope it comes up here. Well, it doesn't say it, but it's 1,414 pages. The shipping weight is seven and a half pounds, which to give you some idea of scale is actually twice the weight of a human brain in this textbook. And so it's interesting to teach this course. It's interesting to try and organize all this information, but frankly, it's not so exhilarating as working in the lab. And so I began to think about why that was. And of course, I think the reason is that in the lab, we talk about what we don't know. And in the course, I just talk about what we do know and a lot of facts. And I don't necessarily think that's really what science is about. So I, um, I thought I'd start another class. I just tried this class, which I called ignorance. And uh, it's a simple class. Um, it meets once a week for two hours. It's for undergraduates, mostly senior undergraduates. Um, and uh, we meet for two hours, and it's a kind of a seminar course, although now there have been a number of students who have grown to be about 40 or 50 or so in there. And it's very simple. I invite scientists from the faculty at Columbia, around New York, people passing through, to come in and sit for two hours and talk to students about what they don't know. I, I joke that I call some colleague on the phone and say, hi, Al, listen, I'm teaching this course on ignorance, and I think you'd be perfect. And, uh, but, but of course, they almost immediately realize that they are exactly that, that that's what they think about all the time. And so I'm asked, well, how do I prepare for this? And I say, you don't prepare at all. You are prepared. There's no PowerPoint. There's no lecture. Um, I just want you to come in here the way you walk into your lab in the morning. And you and I will have a discussion in front of the class. They will join in, and we'll talk about what you don't know, uh, why you have this question versus that question, why it makes this question more important than that one, what will happen if you answer it, what will happen if you don't answer it, what questions remain, what, et cetera, et cetera. And two hours zips on by, and it's been quite an interesting experience, I have to say. As a result of teaching this course, an unexpected thing happened. I uh, had a friend from, uh, who's an editor at Oxford Press who had been trying to get me to edit a volume on a handbook of sensory physiology or some horrible thing like that, which I, of course, didn't want to do. So she uh, insisted on taking me out to dinner one night, trying to get me drunk, I guess, so that I would, she could talk me into doing this terrible editing job. And I said, well, I only have this one night. We could have dinner after this class at 8 o'clock. Or if you want to come to the class, you might find it interesting. You know, it'd be fun. So 
Then we'll go out to dinner. So she came to the class, we went out to dinner, and the first thing she said was, so you're definitely gonna do a book for me. Forget that handbook, I want you to write a book on this course. I thought, well, that's completely unexpected. I'm a scientist, I write papers. The longest thing I've ever written is a review article, for which I'm sorry for. And um, uh, the idea of a book was kind of somewhat foreign to me, but I thought I had a lot of material maybe to be interesting. So I went ahead and wrote this book, and, um, and it became, it was sort of popular, it's still around and all the rest of that. And so uh, Oxford came back to me and said, would you like to write a second book? Which really seemed crazy, but I said, the only other thing I really know anything about is failure. So uh, I could write a book for you on failure. So I did. So now I have this little niche market, you see. I have ignorance and failure is just kind of my thing. So, so I'm going to... <laughs> yes, there's, there'll be a trilogy, but I can't talk about the, <laughs> the third one yet. Um, so, so let me just give you a very quick background on why I think ignorance is important and why that leads to failure. And then the failure, of course, will have to do with replication failure. So that's the preamble part of all of this. Um, I'll begin with what I think is a really interesting little aphorism that I find the best description of science that I'm aware of, which says it's very difficult to find a black cat in a dark room especially when there is no cat. And to me, this is a perfect description of how science actually works. Not the scientific method, not by some recipe, but by fumbling around in dark rooms, getting bruised up, bumping into things. Cats are there sometimes, most often they're not. After you find out there is no cat, you just move to another completely black room and bump into some more things. There have been reports of a cat in the area, they may be reliable, they may be replicable, they may not, whatever it is, but this is how it works. Not by some method, not by some recipe in which you put data in the top of the hopper and turn some crank and out, out come gadgets and cures and things of that nature. So that's sort of the basis of, of the idea behind this. Uh, I'd like this quote in particular from uh, Marie Curie. This was in a letter to her brother that she wrote just after attaining her second graduate degree. So she knew a lot of stuff, but that's clearly not what she was interested in. She says in here, one never notices what has been done, one can only see what remains to be done. I thought it's what the remains to be done which is the key to science, and that's why, that's what we do. So when we go to meetings, we don't talk about what we know. We, I mean, you sit through some boring presentations and then you head for the bar where nobody talks about what they know. We only talk about what the important questions are. So um, here's another quote that I like from, from uh, physicist James Clerk Maxwell. Thoroughly conscious ignorance is the prelude to every real advance in science. I think this idea of thoroughly conscious ignorance is important. I don't, by ignorance, I don't mean the typically pejorative kinds of ignorance like stupidity and a willful uh, uh, disinterest in facts or ignoring facts, things like that. I mean this sort of thoroughly conscious ignorance, which I'll talk about just a little bit more in a moment. Um, Yes, so, uh, um, right, so, so I would say then that science is, uh, I'm sort of blowing through this a little quicker than I normally do, so I don't want to get, I don't want to lose anything. Science is essentially a search for better ignorance. The notion I like to think of as ignorance is that there's, there's all kinds of ignorance. There's low quality ignorance and there's high quality ignorance and there's a difference between them and this is what we care about. So I think this is what scientists mostly argue about. Um, sometimes we call these bull sessions and sometimes we call them grant proposals and sometimes it's hard to tell the difference, but essentially we're arguing about the quality of our ignorance. So what is it that we do with knowledge once we get it? We use it to ask a better question, a more sophisticated question, a deeper question. The only value of knowledge, it seems to me, or the primary value of knowledge. This is stated very nicely in a term called negative capability, which was coined by the poet John Keats, also in a letter to his brother. And he defined negative capability as when a man, I might say a person, I hope, is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, and doubts without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. And he considered this to be the ideal creative state. Now, he's thinking of a literary state, I suppose, but I think, of course, science works by being in a creative state as well. And I think this idea of developing negative capability, the ability to be patient with ignorance, to be patient with mystery, doubt, and uncertainty, because this is where the real creative stuff happens, is crucial, absolutely crucial. And in fact, it was restated, or stated again, by Erwin Schrodinger, who I don't think knew the Keats quote, 
um, but who did know something about caps, I guess, or, or didn't, as the case may be, right? Um, who said, in an honest search for knowledge, you quite often have to abide by ignorance for an indefinite period. <clears throat> and I think this notion of patience with ignorance, negative capability, which seems a bit like an oxymoron, is a crucial thing to develop in students and, and in practicing scientists. OK, so that's the ignorance part of it. Now I have to get to this. Sorry to introduce this character to your Sunday morning. This you may recognize as Donald Rumsfeld, the once, uh, <coughs> once Secretary of Defense, <coughs> the architect of the ill-begotten adventures in Iraq and Afghanistan. <coughs> Pardon me, that water is dangerous stuff. Do you have any wine around here? <laughs> <laughs> Much easier time drinking wine, it seems, than water. Um, so Rumsfeld famously was testifying in front of Congress about how badly the, uh, the war efforts in Iraq and Afghanistan were going, and he was talking about the things that we knew we didn't know about and they were problematic, but then he said this thing that what the real problem was, the unknown unknowns, the things we don't even know, we don't know. Um, and he was roundly ridiculed for this, but of course it's really a very clever thing to have said, because if you think ignorance is what, so, <laughs> what more you're bringing, are you trying to drown me? <laughs> <laughs> So if you think ignorance is, is important in science, is basic to science, then there's an even greater kind of ignorance, an even deeper kind of ignorance, and that's this unknown unknown, the stuff we don't even know we don't know. Fortunately, I'm happy to say I spent a ridiculous amount of time on this, doing some research on it, and found out that there's somebody said this before Rumsfeld, thankfully. Um, and that was, of all people, the poet uh, D.H. Lawrence in a long uh, uh, epic poem called New Heaven and Earth. It, the poem was not that good, don't bother reading it, in my opinion, but um, <laughs> not one of his best. It was a rather long epic poem, and it has to do with the transition from this life to the next life to the next world, whatever it might be. And towards the end of it, there's a verse that says, Now here was I, new awakened, with my hand stretching out and touching the unknown, the real unknown, the unknown unknown. So the question then is, how do we get to this unknown unknown? How do we get to this deepest level of ignorance? And I would say that the path to doing that is through failure. That's how you get to know what you didn't know. You do an experiment because you don't know something. You think you're going to know it at the end of the experiment, but instead the experiment doesn't work. Well, now you know there was something you didn't know that you didn't know to put into that experiment. Now you have to kind of go back again and think a little harder because you've uncovered a deeper, a deeper kind of ignorance yet. This is a quote from Benjamin Franklin, arguably America's first scientist anyway. Perhaps the history of errors of mankind, all things considered, is more valuable and interesting than that of their discoveries. I mean, after all, truth is uniform and narrow, but screwing up <laughs> those endless numbers of ways you can do that, of course. So it's much more interesting somehow or another. Um, so once again, though, with failure, I don't mean the kind of common and, and pejorative type things or even self-helpy type, th type things that people mean like with ignorance. So I don't mean things like success is learning to fail again and again with no lack of enthusiasm, often attributed to Winston Churchill, who in fact never said this. Fail hard, fail fast is a favorite in the tech industry these days. I've discovered 10,000 ways that don't work. Thomas Edison did say this about inventing the light bulb, which is curious because we use the light bulb. It's like, oh, I had a great idea, right? <laughs> but in fact, he claimed he found 10,000 ways that didn't work first. Failure is an opportunity, the opportunity to begin again more intelligently. This actually was on a fortune cookie in a Chinese restaurant that I got, so I, I take a picture of it. It says, failure is opportunity in disguise. Uh, if you're 40 years old and never had a failure, you've been deprived. That was said by the actress Gloria Swanson. Not quite sure what she was referring to, but I find it intriguing. But nonetheless, I don't mean any of these kinds of failures. These are fine if you have a friend on the phone who's just failed in business or love or sport or whatever it might be. And, and you want to perk them up or whatever, but I'm not talking about this kind of failure at all. I'm talking about a kind of failure that I like to use a couple of quotes on because I think it was well stated by Gertrude Stein, who said, a real failure does not need an excuse, it is an end in itself. This notion of a failure being an end in itself, I think is worth thinking about for a while. It's not so, like much of Gertrude Stein's work, it seems, okay, yeah, sure, I get that, and then you think about it some more and you realize you, you don't, quite grasp it entirely. But the notion of failure is an end in itself, not retrospectively valuable because it eventually led to success, because you learned something from it, but because failure is part of a process. Similarly with uh, another one, this is by the ever enigmatic Samuel Beckett, ever tried, ever failed, 
no matter, try again, fail again. This all sounds like the old, you know, typical self-help thing. And then he says, fail better. What a curious idea to fail better. Not just to succeed, not to try, fail, try, fail, eventually succeed, but to fail better. Can we learn to, in fact, fail better? So I think the notion here is that it's, as I said, not only valuable retrospectively because you got some success or some unexpected discovery, I think they're all fine, but they're not a requirement for failure to be valuable. Failure is integrated in the process of science. You can't leave it out. You can't avoid it. But I think you can utilize it, and I think you can get better at it. I think you can get way better at it, in fact. All right, so it might be worthwhile asking then how much failure, right? If you think failure is important, <laughs> ignorance is important, how much of this stuff can we take? You can't fail 100% of the time, presumably. But I think we regularly underestimate the amount of failure that's acceptable. So I'll use a simple example. I could use many others. But here are, you know, evolution's winners, right? This is the top of the food chain. These are the kings or queens or whatever of, the, of their particular niches, the land, the sea, the air. These guys are the evolution's best products, as it were, okay? And yet, uh, and, and I'm sure you may think, as I once did, that on any time they get a little hungry, they just go out and bag themselves a little snack. But in fact, there's a vast literature on predator-prey relations, and these guys are successful on fewer than 25% of their tries. So 70 to 75% of the time that they go out after a predator, after a prey, they fail. That's why there's so many prey animals still out there in the fields, you know. Um, so, and so yet they are considered to be the top of the food chain. So apparently you can have a very successful life uh, by failing some 70% of the time, which I think is somehow unexpected. Another question you could then ask is how big a failure? Well, let's go for a debacle. All right, there's no bigger failure you can have. Its current definition is an unmitigated disaster, a total failure. But the word has an interesting etymology. It comes from the French, debâcle, a word not much in common use anymore, as it turns out, in French. But it means to free, unbar, or unleash. It originally had a nautical meaning, meaning ice-breaking, the idea of breaking up some solid obstruction to create a new pathway. Well, that sounds kind of better now, doesn't it, than just an unmitigated disaster. So I think we often think that creativity arises from associating new ideas, but I think just as often it uh, may come from dissociating ideas that have been too long associated. Philosopher Ortega y Gasset, the Spanish philosopher, said it noted that it costs more to dissociate ideas than to, uh, to dissociate ideas than to associate them. So this idea of a debacle, I would say, still exists in our word breakthrough, and, and we consider that a major discovery somehow or another, and yet it's a breaking up of things, it's a breaking up of some things. So failure is endemic to this idea of discovery, it seems to me. All right, so now finally we can see if this can apply to replication somehow or another, which I think has now been a misrepresentation of failure because it's always looked at pejoratively and negatively. And I would say, actually, the failure to replicate an experiment can quite often be very positive and, and a crucial part of science. So this is a famous uh, Richard Feynman uh, ditty. The first principle is that you must not fool yourself. And of course, you are the easiest person to fool. And so one thinks that, well, one, one, uh, one remedy for this is replication, is reproducibility. Um, or, or replication failure is also important. Um, I'll get back to this bit later. Let me just go on from this. So, so the question then is about this replication thing is, is science broken? Um, we've seen a lot of this. I'm just going to go over it very quickly. You know, this started with John Ioannidis' article in 2005, why most public published research findings are false. I'll come back to this. I think there's an interesting side to this. John Maddox, the editor, the longtime editor of Nature in the 70s, 80s, 90s, I don't know, he was there for forever, was once asked by a reporter, how many papers in Nature do you think turn out to be wrong? And Maddox shot back at me and said, oh, that's easy, all of them. Because that, of course, is finally true. They all will be wrong, and they all should be wrong. Um, this is the paper, of course, in some ways, even though it came after the Ioannidis paper, that seemed to have started it all. Uh, uh, Begley and Ellis, these two retired Amgen uh, executives, uh, complained about having uh, gone over, what was it, 56 papers published in leading journals with landmark results in cancer, of which only six could they felt could be replicated. The finding that six could be replicated, what they called a dismal 11% success rate. 
I think this paper is an absolute travesty as the foundation of this whole replication failure business because it's a paper that cannot be fucking replicated. Why? Because there's no data in it. Because the authors have refused to provide the names of the papers that they claim they were unable to replicate. They have refused to provide any data on what parts of those papers couldn't be replicated or anything else about them. And so there's no way to replicate this paper. And yet it stands somehow or another as the anchor for this entire replication failure business. And I think wrongly so. I would also say that an 11% success, 11 success rate working on the very frontiers of cancer research and publishing landmark, potentially landmark findings is pretty damn good. I wish my lab had an 11% success rate, frankly, and I bet the guys at Amgen really wish they had an 11% success rate, which I guarantee you they do not. So I think the word dismal is misplaced here. All right, that's enough of that rant, sorry. Um, and then finally, of course, it went public and has continued to go public. This is The Economist uh, devoting the, some significant part of an issue in the cover to how science goes wrong. And one of the terrible things in this article uh, is that there was a conflation of fraud with replication failure. This, I think, is an extremely dangerous thing. Now, nobody in this room makes that mistake, but I think the public in general does. I think the public in general, and by that I include politicians and others, and even to some extent administrators, do not see the clear difference between fraud, for which I would reinstitute the death penalty, and replication failures, which are, in my opinion, usually honest mistakes. Maybe they're due to sloppiness or this or that, but nonetheless, there's rarely an attempt to produce fraud. So I think those are quite different things, and yet when they get conflated, it becomes very serious public policy problem. So I want to tell a short story about a replication failure. This was a, this was a fellow named Otto Lowy who worked in uh, Vienna, Austria in the 1920s. Um, and uh, at that time, um, there was a great controversy in neuroscience as to whether the connection between neurons at synapses or between neurons and muscles was an electrical connection. We all knew that there was electricity in the brain. I mean, there were action potentials and things like that. But was that, was the connection between one neuron, one neuron and another electrical, or was there a chemical substance released by the, what's called the presynaptic cell onto the postsynaptic cell, some diffusible chemical? This was known as the war of the soups and the sparks. It was a huge controversy that went on at the time. And Lowy one night had a dream of an experiment that would settle the issue. So he wakes up in the middle of the night and writes down the idea for the experiment and goes back to sleep. He wakes up the next morning, looks at the scribbles and cannot decipher one word of what he had scribbled down, nor can he remember the dream, except for having had it. He is beside himself, as you can imagine. So a couple of days apparently pass by and he goes and, and back to sleep and he has the dream again. But this time taking no chances, and this may seem irrelevant, but it's quite relevant to the story, this time taking no chances, he rushes to the lab at two o'clock in the morning and does the experiment. And here's the experiment that he does. So Lowy takes a frog heart, which you know will beat, the heart, the heart beats on its own, it doesn't need a nerve supply, but it has a nerve supply, it has the vagus nerve innervating it, and that will regulate, modulate the beating of the heart. And so it was known that if you took a frog heart, put it in a chamber, a bath, it would beat away, and then if you stimulated the vagus nerve, it would slow down the heart rate. Here's where he stimulates the nerve, and then shortly after that, the heart slows down as a result of some input from this nerve. So this was relatively well known. What uh, Lowy did was to take a second frog heart that was denervated, that did not have the vagus nerve on it, and put it in another chamber, but connected to this first chamber, so that whatever was in here could also diffuse over to here. And when he stimulated, once again, this vagus nerve, but looked at the beat of heart number two, whoops, what did I do, hold on, okay. Looked at the beat of heart number two, what he saw was that after, here's where he stimulates the nerve, it continued to beat, but then it began to slow down as well. The inescapable conclusion being that there was some diffusible chemical that came out of this nerve that affected this heart and then eventually affected this heart. And thus, neurotransmission was chemical in nature. Though we won the Nobel Prize for this in 1936, was it, with Henry Dale, another pharmacologist. But here's what a lot of people don't know, which was that for six years, nobody, including Lowy, could replicate this damn experiment. Nobody could replicate it for six years. 
Why, as it turned out, was that Lowy performed this experiment, I told you this was going to be relevant, at 2 o'clock in the morning, in the middle of the winter, in a freezing cold laboratory, because they turned the heat off at night in Austria then. And so the laboratory was quite cold, but all replications, including Lowy's, were done during normal business hours, during the day, when the lab was heated. But it turns out, right, that there's an important enzyme that nobody knew about called acetylcholine esterase, which breaks down acetylcholine. It's very important. So after the acetylcholine, by the way, so we call this, this chemical substance Vega stuff, which is <laughs> the typical German kind of way of doing it, but we now know it's acetylcholine. And there's an enzyme, acetylcholine esterase, that breaks down acetylcholine, so it gets rid of it very quickly, so that another, uh, another packet of it can have an effect, right? And um, this degrading enzyme, however, which nobody knew about at the time, its action, like all enzymes, is very temperature dependent. And it was very slow in the cold, the cold nighttime laboratory, giving the acetylcholine the chance to diffuse away from the acetylcholine esterase, which is trapped in the synapse. But later experiments, the acetylcholine was just eaten up very quickly by acetylcholine esterase, and they could never see the effect. I should also point out that the frog is cold-blooded, and, and its uh, cardiac physiology, which nobody knew at the time, was altered also by season. And so depending on what season you did this in, you would get different results. So the point I think here is, though, that this is all detailed in a book called The War of the Soups and the Sparks, in fact, that nobody would have thought to include in their method section the time of day, the month of year, the et cetera, et cetera, that the experiments were done. And so this is why the replication took so long and why it couldn't be, why it couldn't be performed so easily. All right. So, um, so I think that... Here's the way I like to define replication. We've, to some extent, been over this, but I want to I make it sort of more explicit. So I think something that can be reproduced, that is, can be replicated, well, this is the common definition, is reliable. And therefore, if something cannot be replicated, it's unreliable. I don't agree with that. What I would say is that in science, failure to replicate data does not mean that the data is unreliable. Failure to replicate is like any other failure in science. There's something to be learned from it. There's something we didn't know we didn't know. It indicates that we have some unknown variable that has gone unrecognized, something's not fully understood, and it's worth another look. There are a lot of reasons for the failure to replicate. Sure, it could be wrong, it could be just partly wrong, it could be partly right, there could be an inadequate experimental technique that a later te technological um, uh, innovation uh, shows us something different. Uh, most often, it's simply that we don't know why it didn't replicate, but we could find out. And the finding out, of course, is the looking for the unknown unknown. I think the crucial thing, and I know I'm speaking to the choir here to some extent about this, but I don't think it's generally recognized outside the elite people in this room and scientists that publication is not a conclusion of a process. It's an intermediate step. My favorite quote of mine is from Charles Gillespie, the uh, historian of science, who said, in science, revision is a victory. And I think this is a crucial notion to maintain, that revision is a victory in science. It's what we are always trying to do. So in some sense, yes, everything is a replication failure. This speaks to some extent to what uh, Richard was talking about and this idea of pre-registration to some extent. This is a paper that was written by uh, Peter Medawar, who's often known as the, the Carl Sagan of England, or Carl Sagan was the American Peter Medawar, or whatever it was, but they were both uh, uh, working scientists who were extremely good at, at uh, communicating science to the public. Medawar was a Nobel Prize winning immunologist, I have a picture of him, there he is, who wrote this little article for the Saturday Review called, Is the Scientific Paper Fraudulent? You can imagine what, what kind of a raucous this would raise today, but it didn't then. And his answer was, yes, it misrepresents scientific thought. We all know that it does, because in its orthodox form, it embodies a totally mistaken conception of the nature of scientific thought, in the sense that the, the experiments, the results are never presented in the chronological order in which they occurred, or rarely so. So the middle experiment is presented first, the last one first, or in the middle and the last. One never knows. One, one never knows. They come out in the order that narratively makes sense once the results are understood. But it's not it has nothing to do with the chronological order in which they were performed. One of the difficulties of pre-registration, in my opinion, for at least certain kinds of research. Um, I have a favorite thing I always tell students in my lab. If you're reading a paper and you get about midway through it or something and a paragraph starts with the phrase, we reason that, then you know the rest of it's bullshit. 
because that, that has never happened, in fact. That has never happened. Um, so this, I think, centers around the method section of the paper. Now, that's not what Medawar was talking about so much. He was talking about more about the results section. But I think it, it centers around a certain misunderstanding of what the method section of a paper is supposed to do. So we're generally taught and continue to teach, I think, in schools that the method section of a paper should contain all the information necessary to repeat the experiments. I believe that phrase is completely erroneous, or that better word for it may be even than that. This is by no means, I believe, the purpose of a method section of a paper. Um, uh, Michael Pogliani, of course, and, and Harry Collins later and others uh, talk about tacit knowledge. There are several examples of this, all of which you guys all know, so I'm not going to go through them. But I think the important thing is that a methods section of a paper provides assurance to other scientists that for the experiments described, normal accepted methods were used, and if some unusual method or new technology was used, then it deserves further explanation or expanded explanation and further justification. Replicability, with or without actual replication, is the essential feature of science. So the methods have to indicate that it's possible to replicate this work. You don't need special sauce. You don't have to do any funny dance. You don't need an incantation. You need none of that. Everything is available to replicate. This is an experiment that can be replicated. Whether it's ever replicated or not to me is unimportant. It's only valuable if it was valuable for further progress to see it replicated. I like this uh, from Jeff, uh, Jeff Settlement who works for Calico Life Sciences. You know, you, you give Julia <laughs> Childs and me the same recipe, you're not going to get the same dinner, believe me. So you can't just follow the method section. Um, usually what goes on is if you have a problem replicating a result and extending it, you call the author, you call the, the communicating author and say, so what, what did you do here really, or what went on, or what do I need to know? I have on many occasions, and I'm not alone in this, sent a graduate student or a postdoc to the laboratory where some work was done. I said, go, go do the experiment with them. And then remarkably, they come back able to do the experiment, able to get the result. It, and they often can't tell you why. You know, because there was some step in there that said, we let the cells incubate for 30 minutes. But then when you go there, you find that actually that was the 30 minutes that they had during the experiment to run and get a cup of coffee. <laughs> Depending on when it was, the, the line was longer or shorter, so it wasn't really 30 minutes. It was some other thing that the experimenter estimated, came back and looked at it and said, yeah, that's long enough, and went on. And learning what that, yeah, that's long enough was, was the whole key to making the experiment work. But in the method section, you say 30 minutes because it averaged about, it felt like 30 minutes most of the time. So again, publication is not the conclusion, it's an intermediate step. I think replication <laughs> failures should be expected. And I think perhaps in some cases at a very high rate. So, so every one is not a disaster. In fact, many of them should be expected and they should occur quite a lot. In more complicated sciences, by which I do not mean the so-called hard sciences, like physics or chemistry, but the really complicated ones, like systems level biology, psychology, sociology, there are yet more unknown variables. And so one would expect more replication failures, and one would expect them to be more interesting as well. In biology, indeed, noise or variability is often the data of interest. And yet most statistical techniques or most analytical techniques are there to get rid of the noise. And often, you you know, the good stuff winds up on the floor of the freezer room there, the piece you cut out of the Western blot or something like that. Um, so this gets to the, the problem of certainty, what I call the problem of certainty, and the value of uncertainty, which I think is also what science is built on. So in many areas of life, we like uncertainty, right? You play poker, you don't want to know how the hand's going to come out before you, I mean, you might want to know, but it kind of takes the fun out of the game. Uh, sporting events, you don't watch a game if you already know the score. Um, none of us probably, I think, in this room want to know the exact time and date of our death. So that's a nice thing to have, sort of uncertain. So there are many times when we welcome uncertainty. But I think these kinds of uncertainties have a fundamental difference from uncertainty in science, because in all of these cases, the uncertainty will resolve. The hand will be shown, the roulette ball will fall, the score will be published. I'm sorry to say that somewhere in some office that there will be a piece of paper with the date and time of all of our deaths on it. And so all of these things will be resolved. Science, I think, has a kind of much grander uncertainty because there may not be an ultimate solution. There's no guarantee 
that this puzzle has all the pieces in the box, as it were. There may be no final resolution or no guaranteed complete answer. So the purpose in science, I think, is not to develop certainty, not to develop priors of zero or one, but to develop stable probabilities. Um, the question is not how to become certain, but how do we get on successfully while accepting uncertainty, while welcoming uncertainty in so some cases. Oh, I meant to cut this slide. <laughs> it's a little embarrassing now. <laughs> well, now, well now, now I guess at least you'll, you'll get some useful information out of this talk, because I'll, I'll go through this very quickly. It speaks to evidence, I suppose. Um, I got this little piece from a, from a magician named Apollo Robbins. He's a well-known, or among some circles, a famous magician in Las Vegas. He's known as the gentleman's pickpocket. His deal is you can stand there and talk with him, and you're just having a conversation or a drink, and when you walk away, you don't have your belt, you don't have your watch, you don't have your wallet, you don't have your rings, you have nothing on you. Everything is gone, and he's taken it away. It's remarkable. And you didn't feel a thing somehow or another. So, so he was the one who I, I first learned about this, this discussion. So how to hide a dead body? So you've got a dead body on your hands, you've got to get rid of it. The best thing to do is go to the nearest public park and dig a hole. You dig a hole eight feet deep and you put the body in it, okay? And then you fill it in. Let me see, yeah, fill it in. Now along come the, oh, I should point, yeah, now, so along come the police and um, and they see, they know there's a dead body somewhere, and they see, oh, the ground here has been disturbed, go get the cadaver dogs, the cadaver dogs come, they smell the cadaver. What they don't know, of course, is that before you filled it in, as you filled it in, you put a dead dog in there at four feet. <laughs> so the police come along, the cadaver dogs are going crazy, they start digging away, they dig, they dig, they dig, they get down to four feet, it's a dog, somebody buried their pet, and on they go. <laughs> the body is safely hidden. But how many times have we stopped an experiment too soon because we got the expected result? Or, well, you get the idea. So there's big issues of evidence with this. Now you know how to hide a dead body too, so let me get back to the, get back to the talk. <laughs> Sorry. So, um, all right, so, so, so this hasn't been discussed, and I'm sort of surprised that it hasn't come up until now. So I'm going to tell you this little story that happened to me recently that I think shows the potential dangers, the real dangers of this reproducibility crisis, or at least putting the word crisis along with irreproducibility. I, this dropped into my email box in uh, mid-March. Um, it's a little uh, email from a woman named Kelly Carinder. Uh, Director of Communications at something called the NAS, or the National Association of Scholars. Curiously, the same acronym that stands for National Academy of Sciences, which they traffic in quite a bit. And it's an invitation to come to the launch of a document that this National Association of Scholars has been working on, is going to launch it on the irreproducibility crisis in science. This will be launching at the Rayburn, uh, Rayburn Office House Building in Washington, uh, representative, I don't know how well you can see this, but Representative Lamar Smith, the biggest idiot in the world, mostly anti-science, crazy person, fortunately retiring, although he'll just be replaced by another nutcase. But he was the chairman of the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. He's going to speak. It turns out this National Association of Scholars is largely a front group for an ultra-right-wing Tea Party conservative group that likes to go to college campuses and schedule Nazis to talk and then scream and yell when everybody says no they can't talk about what happened to freedom of speech and so forth and so on. So that's their shtick. But now they're into science, right? So they have a launch event on the irreproducibility crisis of modern science, causes, consequences, and the road to reform. I panicked when I saw this, I have to say. I called John Ioannidis and I said, are you happy now? <laughs> because <laughs> this is where it's going. This is clearly the kind of agnotology approach that, that the big tobacco used, that the climate change people use, but now they're gonna use science on science. And indeed, if you look through this thing, here's the, the, the scary looking cover of it. Here are the two authors, uh, David Randall, who's the director of research at the NAS, uh, wrote some book on this. He's, he's got some sort of a, a couple of degrees. I mean, he's not entirely illegitimate. Uh, the second author is Christopher Welser, a research associate there. Um, he teaches Latin in Minneapolis, but has a long-standing interest in the year of producibility of science. So, I don't know, these two guys from nowhere wrote this entire report up. 
There's John Ioannidis, right in the introduction, the executive summary. There's John Ioannidis. I won't read all this to you, except that I'll just highlight that in 2005, Dr. John Ioannidis argued shockingly and persuasively that most published research findings in his own field of medicine were false. And then down towards the bottom, he talks about there's a bunch of factors for this. And then Ioannidis documented that when you accounted for all these factors, all of which we've talked about today, a majority of research findings in medicine, italics, and in many other scientific fields were probably wrong. This is the beginning of the executive summary. Uh, they're very worried about how much it's all costing, $28 billion annually. I have no idea where that number comes from, and they never tell you. It's presumably just the amount of research being done, and they, since they think most of it's wrong. That's the waste of money. That's the amount of money being wasted. Um, they also worry that it distorts public policy and public expenditure in areas such as public health, climate science, and marriage and family law. Ooh, that's interesting. <laughs> That's interesting. And of course, they're worried about, or claim to be worried about, the gravest casualty of all, the authority that science ought to have with the public, which has been forfeiting through its embrace of practices that no longer serve to produce reliable knowledge. And they go on to support this in a, a rather thick volume, which I won't trouble you with, at the end of which, however, they make 40 recommendations. I'm not going to go through 40 recommendations with you. I'm just going to scroll through this and point out a couple of the more interesting ones. Researchers should adopt the best existing practice, the most rigorous science, and define established significance as a P.01 rather than 0 0.05, at least not 0 0.005. I would like us all to consider what kind of a world we'd be living in right now if we had adopted P.01, what cures we wouldn't have, what drugs we wouldn't be able to take, what inventions would not be around. There would be quite a different world, the P.01 world than the P.05 world is, neither of which I agree with, mind you, but nonetheless, this is a ridiculously radical, ridiculously radical suggestion. Here's another one. Researchers should pre-register their research proposals, filing them in advance. This is, for all the reasons um, I agree with Richard, this is, this is potentially problematic because who's going to review these things? Who's going to say this does or does not match? Who's going to make those judgments when this becomes public uh, prematurely? Uh, this sounds right at first. Basic statistics should be integrated into high school and college math and science curricula and should emphasize the limits to the certainty that statistics can provide. So you see, there's always a catch. Every one of these has a bit of a catch. University policies or affect professional associations. Um, each discipline institutionalized regular evaluations of its intellectual openness by committees of extradisciplinary professionals dressed in uniforms, I assume, of some sort or another, and boots. I don't know what they'll look like. Uh, it goes to professional journals, to the scientific industry. You can read through these at your leisure. You can download this thing, of course. Private philanthropy should establish an annual prize, the Michelson-Morley Award, mind you, uh, for the most significant negative results published in a scientific field. Again, it sort of sounds good, but you know what will be made of this, right? You know that there's a nefarious purpose behind all of this. Government funding, I don't even want to get into. Um, government regulation, of course, this is quite important. Government agencies should insist that all new regulations requiring scientific justi justification rely solely on research that meets strict reproducibility standards. And that existing research should be rescinded. Existing regulations should be rescinded if they're not based on demonstrably reproducible results. Well, you know where this leads. You see it going on in the EPA right now and those arguments. Uh, Congress shall pass an expanded Secret Science Reform Act. How dangerous does that sound? That finally didn't happen because it was when Obama was still president and everybody realized it would have been vetoed. But it's now reappeared in the form of what's called the HONEST Act. HONEST sounds some acronym that stands for some bullshit, but it's the same thing that has to do with, with making regulations only based on reproducible <coughs> research. It involves state legislatures, government staffing, even the judiciary is supposed to be reformed along these lines. So nothing is left untouched. So you can see, I think, how dangerous this is. Now, I will say, fortunately, this launch occurred on April 17th. I, at the time, as I say, called John Ioannidis and several other people in a bit of a panic, and I said, what do you think we should do about this? And the consensus sort of turned out to be, well, let's just see, because there's no sense giving this any more oxygen than it deserves. These things get announced all the time. Nobody pays attention. Maybe it'll just pass over. And indeed, it did seem to pretty much pass over. It seems that nobody in this room was even somehow or another aware of it. Um, 
And so that's okay, but I still think this is just the first attempt. This is a trial balloon to see where this will go, how much objection there will be and how far we can go on it, and it will get referred back to again and again. And all through it, all through it, are quotes from legitimate, well-known scientists who have made these, I think, very loose statements about reproducibility, irreproducibility, and calling it a crisis. When I will say again that from my point of view, it's largely a natural part of science. So where does the problem come from? Where, why is it so easy to convince the, the non-scientific public, the, the non-history and philosophy of science public that these things are true? And I would say, so I have some recommendations. I'll give them quickly. My recommendations, I have them in lots of areas, of course, but I think the key ones are in education. And I think part of the problem is the way we educate, the way we teach science in schools today. So, for example, I would not teach statistics, but I would teach probability. I think teaching statistics is actually quite a bad idea. First of all, it's just cookbook. And it gives you the idea that you can cookbook your way to significance or insignificance, and that's all that's required. Probability requires thinking. Probability is a thoughtful process that requires, and, and you know, the, the statistics equations that you just use by looking them up when you need this one or that one, all come from probability theorem and, and the application of calculus or whatever derivations there are. But, but, but one should be teaching probability because that's where we're not good. People always say, oh, you know, humans, human beings have bad statistical um, uh, intuition. And I don't think it's bad statistical intuition. I think it's bad probability intuition and that that's what really needs to get taught. I think we should teach a scientific process, not these potted, heroic narratives that, that, that never include any of the failures. My, my favorite is the so-called Ark of Discovery, which you'll find in most textbooks. Here you can go from Copernicus all the way through these big names to Einstein, and kaboom, you have physics. That's all there really is, right? But, but we know that's not really true. There's no Ark of Discovery. There's a confused, messy, black room, nasty, intuitive, often wrong path to discovery that may include some of these people, but, you know, it went, went more like that, I think. And, of course, there are a lot of people who don't get included in this narrative. I'm sorry to say among them, mostly among them women. So Caroline Herschel, Marie-Anne Lavoisier, uh, Maleva uh, Maric, is that how you say her name? Yes. Uh, Irene Curie. So there are many people who don't get mentioned in these things. And there are many mistakes, many failures, many wrong turns that are of great value to learn about, great value to know about, if for no other reason than you know how science progresses in this iterative, sometimes fumbling way. This notion of levels of wrong, that there are many ways to be wrong, that there's not right or wrong, as Richard said, it's not a binary issue. My favorite example, I'm sure you'll all know this or have thought of it yourselves, I mean, there's the Ptolemaic model of the geocentric solar system or universe or whatever, and of course, that was corrected by, uh, that's wrong, obviously, and then Copernicus, Galileo, and the like come along and come up with the, ge the heliocentric model with planets circling the sun. That's wrong, right? That's wrong. Because Kepler came along and spent, I don't know, six years worrying about eight minutes of arc or something that, that Mars was off by, and came up with a whole slew of mistaken ideas first, and eventually recognized that orbits are elliptical, which was, of course, a key finding. So that's the right one. But of course, if, if you think this is just as wrong as that, then <laughs> there's something wrong with you, right? I mean, clearly, they're not wrong at the same level or wrong in the same way. And indeed, this was not a straightforward path. There were many gaps and, and, and wrong turns. And Kepler alone had, as many of you know in the room here, better than I do, several rather bizarre models before he came up with ellipses. Uh, iterative approaches to knowledge should be taught, narratives of science that are not just settled fact, and I think evidence. Evidence is a word that we all think we know. We all think it's evident, what evidence is somehow or another, but I think it's worth teaching, it's worth discussing, it's worth talking about with high school and college kids. And, and I must say that a lot of this, um, you know, goes on all the way through college. I mean, we continue to promote science as settled, as a final word, and then and then we're curious as to why the public is disappointed when we say, oh yeah, but, but, but we made a little mistake, there, or we're not quite sure, or we're gonna revise that a bit, or we really think a little differently now. Well, we've taught them that science is right. Science is just right, so get back to me when you climate science folks have the right answer, and then I'll stop driving my SUV, maybe. So, so I think this is the problem, and I think this goes on, not just in 
in high school, junior high school or high school, but it goes on all the way through college as an undergraduate, even if you're a science major. So I, I one time decided I should make a list of what I learned as a graduate student that I never learned as a science major in college. So I learned there's no method or recipe, scientific or otherwise, no such thing as a scientific method that I got taught. Nobody uses any such thing. That questions now were more important than facts. Nobody wanted to know what I knew. They wanted to know what my questions were. What was I going to do for an experiment? Answers or facts are temporary. Data and hypotheses are always provisional. Everything's up for grabs. Failure happens a lot. Um, patience is critical, really critical. Uh, occasionally you get lucky. Hopefully you recognize it. Sometimes you don't. Uh, things never happen in that linear narrative way that you read about in the papers or the textbooks. The arc of discovery is a myth. None of these things did I learn in any college science class, even as a science major. Finally, most important, if there's free food, you should get there early. I still know that somehow or another. And there's free food coming up, so I'm, I'm going to end this here <laughs> so that we can, we can move on. Um, let me just end it with, with two short quotes. Uh, one is uh, from uh, Rita Dove, who was our poet laureate for a couple of years, who said, failure is a favor to the future. And it means that you believe in the future somehow or another. The other, by the poet E.E. E. Cummings, always the beautiful answer who asks a more beautiful question. All right, thank you very much. I guess so. Thank you very much. Uh, we all agree, in fact, that's what we, we move in STS for 30 years, and I tried many in high schools to say stop teaching, you know, they're great, like we totally agree with that. But the interesting thing is that now, with all the work that has been done, for example, about tacit knowledge and, thing, and the insistence of uncertainty, what I observe is that many scientists will, in fact, don't want to teach that because they say, well, but if we see to the public, as opposed to ourselves, we know the ins and outs, and all the scientists, in fact, agree with Fire Rabin against method, but Fire Rabin was considered crazy by saying that there's no such thing as a scientific method in his famous book, Against Method, which was seen as kind of relativist thing. So what happened is that you have Bush who says, yes, you're right, teach the controversy. You see, so the fact that we see that science is a, a sort of controversy, knowledge is not absolutely 100% with equation before the one, it's also used, because we have to do that, but we have to know that it will also used by the national, the, those right-wing organizations you mentioned, I, I know them, and that's what they do. It says, he's right, science is not certain, so what can you tell us that there is climate change? Because the, so there is also a negative that yes. it's yeah. not a conclusion that we disagree, that we have to take that into account that Bush now is saying the best constructivist sentence, teach the controversy. And so maybe the Discovery Institute is right because it's a debate between scientists. So we have to so, take that into account. So I think, of course, we've made the crucial error of giving up <laughs> uncertainty to the other side, as it were when we could have used it, in fact, to our own benefit. Because science is a lot more interesting than in a textbook. What's interesting is, here, kids, we don't know this. Anybody have some good ideas? Here are the current ideas. They don't all fit. They don't fit together. And I think that makes the whole thing far more engaging. I was once asked a not so dissimilar question at a talk I gave, oddly enough, it was at a university, but it was mostly the fundraisers. I, I'm not sure why I was invited to this talk, but to give this talk, but I gave a sort of a keynote thing. And one of the questions was, well, you know, but we, we try and raise money for the hospital, for the medical school, so we just, you know, we publicize all the successes. Well, it wouldn't work if we publicized the failures, would it? How could we do that? How could we embrace this? And I thought just the opposite. You want to really engage donors? You say, you know, we've had a war on cancer, it's 50 years old, it's still here. There's more work to be done. It's not just the successes you're paying for, it's the effort you're paying for, it's the engagement with it. Here are the big problems, here are the, the, the remarkable researchers working on the biggest problems you can imagine, and here they are. And when I think, I think when you tell people what the problems are, they get more, everybody's more interested in a puzzle than a solution. And so I think it's, you know, it's up to us to grab that and say, no, the uncertainty is the interesting part of it. That's the cool part of it, not the what we know. I mean, I know that sounds like a pep talk, but I think it's doable. And if we don't do it, they will. So thank you, and I feel very uplifted now. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's
wrong. <laughs> So I hope nothing I said suggested that I don't believe in rigor or a rigorous approach to science. I think, but, but the notion of rigor within my laboratory, so I am rarely just simply replicating another experiment. We read something in a paper, and we now feel that there's, a, there's some value to our work in it, different than what that paper might have been. Sometimes it's not in the olfactory field. It's somebody who's developed some little preparation for getting receptors expressed of some sort, and we think we may be able to adapt it or try it. And so, in that sense, we're replicating it or trying to replicate it, and we have trouble making it work, so we go and find out why it didn't work or what little trick there must be or some unaccounted for thing. To me, the inability to replicate something is not, as I say, a failure, it's an opportunity. It means, oh, something could be really interesting in here something that nobody even thought of, including the people who did the experiment to begin with, that they had some tacit knowledge about it. And so I don't, I don't find there's any lack of rigor in all of that. I also think the important thing, I suppose, is that you know science is a, is an, is a cumulative effort. I mean, it accumulates. That's, in my opinion, kind of what Richard is talking about with progress. Progress is the accumulation of, of scientific knowledge and, and scientific know-how. And that comes, of course, from depending on what went before. But, but sometimes, you know, the bricks get a little soft and have to be, you know, <laughs> you have to reface the property a little bit. Um, things that were, in fact, true become not so true anymore. I often I regularly have the experience of having a student run into my graduates and run into my office with, you know, last week's nature and some paper in it. Say, wow, we could, you know, this is perfect for us. We could just do the next set of experiments, and I'm thinking, trust me, if these people have published that paper, they've already done the next 10 experiments, which they're already readying for publication as well. I often tell them it's much wiser, I think, to go back to Nature 15 years ago. Look for an interesting paper in Nature that, that was in Nature 15 years ago. It was probably a good paper, but they didn't have the techniques or the technologies that we have today. There are lots of things about that paper that are going to be open questions, and in fact, that's worked for us many times to revisit a question, not just for the purpose of replicating it, but for the purpose of now applying new techniques and new technologies and new intellectual ideas that have grown up in the ensuing 15 years that you can now reapply to this question, because it's still a lively question. Just because it was published, not settled. I'm not sure I've answered even a percentage of your question there. No, but it was interesting. <laughs> Good enough, then. I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> we can talk more over lunch. Yeah. uncertainty may be overemphasized. We have good reasons to believe certain things, and we have acquired that evidence over, usually over a period. By the way, you're wrong about Kepler. Kepler was wrong. 
Oh, what he's wrong, too. Oh, well, the, the, that's true. It's not entirely elliptical. That's true. Yeah. Yes. But yeah. I think the idea of certainty is <laughs> we should get rid of. I think it is arrogant. But the idea that we can have very, very good evidence. And that in some cases, yeah, there is a controversy in the sense that a few people may have different views, but they're going against the evidence. Mm -hmm. Yes. Evolution is not an uns. You know what they said in the Dover trial, teach the controversy. To which one answers, what controversy? Yeah, all right. I, <laughs> I, I have a, I'm going to try not to make too long an, an answer over that. I, um, I happen to believe that it's okay to teach intelligent design, for example, because I think there are interesting scientific issues to be had. I mean, the fact of the matter is that to almost everybody's intuition, the world looks designed. Before Darwin, scientists, most of the ones on that list, who, whose minds we respect a great deal, were almost surely intelligent design advocates or something like it anyway, believed that there was a, you know, some design to all of this. Indeed, those ideas held back biology for a long time. Teleology worked in bio, still works in biology, much longer than in any other science. Um, and I think, so for me, the really interesting thing about science, the thing that makes science so remarkable and so wonderful is that it allows you, in, in fact, induces you to think counterintuitively. It has no interest in common sense or what intuitively appears to be the case. I mean, you know, if I walked in here this morning and said, boy, did you see that horizon sinking this morning? That was gorgeous, wasn't it? You'd think I was an idiot. It was a sunrise, right? But we all know it wasn't a sunrise. It was indeed a horizon sinking. But, but that's not the way one thinks until you're a scientist. And, and so I think sometimes looking at the way people thought before they knew enough to think otherwise, actually, for me, that makes Darwin all the more remarkable to me. And now, I understand the different ways you could teach that and all the rest of that, but I think that's a perfect example of evidence. I mean, of the use and misuse of evidence, of evidence that was and was not, the age of the earth, the coming together of geology and population uh, models and things like that, all somehow or another in the notion of probability rather than a determinism. These were major intellectual shifts, it seems to me, that come along with Darwinism and shouldn't just be taught as if, yeah, well, that's, you know, we got that now, right? So I think the process, the gathering of evidence, if you want to talk about evidence, that's a valuable way to do it, or a potentially valuable way to do it in any case. Well, I guess, I mean, my answer is, what do they think the benefit is of learning a ton of facts that they're just going to forget anyway? So, so for some reason or other, people unthinkingly accept this, what I call the bulimic model of education, you know, where we just jam a lot of facts down their throats, they puke it up on an exam and move on to the next unit with no appreciable gain. Mm -hmm. So it's hard for me in a way to understand why, so I would ask people, well, why do you think learning facts is such a good idea? What is it about learning facts beyond getting a grade on an exam, it seems like a good idea to you. Now, I, w I will say I think that the main, this is the beginning of a long discussion, which I won't do, I promise, but, but I, I do think here's where the issue comes, here's where the rubber hits the road, as it were. I think many people know what we need to do in the way of educational reforms. I think John Dewey said it all 100 years ago, frankly, and, and, we, and we still haven't implemented many or any of those ideas. We still talk about those ideas. 
I think the problem is in evaluation and assessment, that we continue to use old and useless tools for evaluating and assessing students, progress, how courses are going, all of these other things. And a serious effort in, <clears throat> in revamping methods of evaluation and assessment would then allow these reforms to simply happen. But until you do that, these reforms can't happen because we don't know how to evaluate or assess the results of them. Now, that's not a simple problem, but I do believe the value of it is it's a scientific problem. Mm -hmm. Developing new methods of evaluation and assessment is computer science, statistics, history, um, all of those sorts of things, game theory, uh, gaming, in fact, all of these kinds of things are involved in evaluation and assessment and could be brought to bear on this problem. So I think it's a soluble, if difficult, problem. And I think that's the only way you'll get ahead because you'll always have people saying, well, what's the value of learning something if it's going to change tomorrow? So, well, I guess there is a change. I mean, of course there's a change. Um, I, I think, w so the first thing is that I, I don't read the literature on my own. Um, if there's an interesting paper, it's discussed in a lab meeting. It's a matter of discussion. Several people read the paper. Nobody sits in a corner and reads the paper alone and tries to make some judgment about it. So, and if there are pieces of it we don't get or don't understand, we generally have some good idea who to ask biochemist for this, or molecular biologist for that, or physicist for this, or, you know, statistician about that. Um, and so we will seek other opinions without thinking about it for the most part. But I think it's a, that, that kind of effort I don't think has, at least for me, has not changed appreciably. Uh, and whether it's right or wrong or correct or not, undeniably we use a certain amount of intuition about whether this sounds right or this sounds way too crazy to be right. And at least that demands deeper looking at it if we'd like to think that it's right. And, and it also, um, there is, for better or worse, a kind of a club, you know. There are people whose papers I know, even if they're a little crazy or strange, I'm willing to go with them a few steps further. And other people who I just think, you know, one paper after another, there's has claimed this or that, and then you never hear another thing about it, and so I'm now going to be careful looking at that. Right. And so you kind of get to know these things. Uh, and that's not the best way to run things, maybe, but, but it works. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really know what else to say about it. So, so I think you just get as many eyes on, on the literature as you can, and, and, you, um, and you make judgments about importance in, in terms of its relevance to you, relevance to your experiments.
No, I don't. I'd say almost all of the effects that the change in the way things are published has happened on the publishing side of it, on whether we push a paper faster than we should or are worried about being scooped or think this or that or whether we want to do open publishing or not open publishing, um, how to keep, frankly, I think one of the more difficult things for a, um, somebody who runs a lab is how to keep students interested in a so in a subject, in a question that remains an open question even after the first big paper has been published. Because then everybody just wants to drop it because everybody just wants the big paper, you know, and all the rest of that. So those, those signs of problems to me are more, for me at least, more serious than getting through the literature. must um, lie to the public, let's say, in some way, because they can't, it's too complex if you tell the truth and so on. And that strikes me as hard to accept, although maybe, <laughs> um, maybe it's possible to uh, tell the truth, but do it in a way that uh, gets through. For example, you can explain that all the answers we come up with are just approximate, but good enough. Penicillin and antibiotics aren't perfect. They don't always work, and it's very complicated how they work. It changes over time, but it saves millions of lives. It's good enough, and this this may be uh, one way to communicate uncertainty in science. There's very difficult issues about how properly to communicate science that'll convey the right message without maybe distorting the truth about how science works. So it's. Not entirely clear what will work best, but it's a difficult issue and one, it's a subject in its own right that requires a lot of uh, work. Yeah, thank you. Just, just quickly, uh, on something you just said, because I hear a lot of neuroscientists say this exact thing, which is that we know who to pay attention to and who to ignore. And this is something that I learned the hard way going from philosophy into neuroscience, right? So I was a psychology and neuroscience professor for many years before coming back to, to philosophy. And I just want to say that I doubt that's true. Hmm. And, okay. and, and, and I think yeah. it's, it's problematic in the following way. So I did a, because I, I heard this exact same, same thing. So I was criticized for criticizing, right? And I said, yeah. well, how do you deal with bad results in the field if you're not willing to criticize them? So we just ignore them. And they go away. So I said, okay, let's take a few papers uh, that you think are, should be ignored, and let's track the citation rate over the next couple mm. of years. And guess what? They're not cited any less than other papers that you think you should pay attention to. So there, there's this interesting tension. It's, and it's very discipline specific. Like, I never heard a psychologist say this. Neuroscientists, however, I've heard several neuroscientists say this exact thing. So, so there's, there's a kind of interesting tension that I think is. It's worth reflecting on whether this is a, a good practice, I guess. Yeah, no, I, 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 I think I sort of said at the end that I'm, the more I talked about it, the less actually good I felt about the practice, even though I, I do think it's the one that is, in fact, in effect most of the time. Um, I, I mean, I do know many terrible papers that do continue to get cited to some extent because of the fame of the researcher or the lab it came out of or this or that, or the fact that you know, quite often if you're a big researcher and you have a big lab and your students go off and your postdocs go off, they'll continue to cite the papers from your lab. And so that seems to be where half the citations come from. But I've, I've always trained students to look carefully at the citations and see whether they all came, what percentage of them came out of the lab that wrote the paper or some person who was in that lab and, and quite often you find that is the case, that these highly cited papers are just highly cited by you know, the family, as it were. Um, it, it's, it's a, it's, I agree, it's a tricky and, and not easy question. Uh, and, and the other side of it is the worry about missing good things because you sort of intuitively think, oh, that's probably bullshit or that's probably not up to par or whatever, and you may miss some good things as well. I mean, I worry about that even more because there's so much out there. But you have to have a sieve somehow or another. You have to put a filter up somewhere, it seems to me. This is 
just a, 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 a sort of a question for both of you. Uh, you. You both and we all think of uh, ooh, the progress of science as something. And do you think that it would be a good thing or a bad thing to try to articulate in more detail what counts as the accumulation of knowledge, or however you want to put it, that things that counts as progress. And I think, I mean, certainly Larry Loudon sort of things mm -hmm. is just off. But trying to come up with a more with a positive thing that actually does justice to it. I mean, what worries me is the idea of you start building a an, uh, an account, and then of course that gets to take over, and then it, you, you you might do more damage than good. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but so I just, what do you guys think about uh, the usefulness of philosophers actually attempting to come up with some more detailed account of what counts as scientific progress in this? long history of uh, work that we were talking about. So uh, I'll give a quick answer, I, I guess, because I know it's a rather big subject, especially in philosophy, in particular philosophy of science. And, and we could have a conference just on that, I think, or two or three of them, I suppose. Um, I think it would be extremely useful, because at the moment, you'll notice that both Richard and I, I think, and probably others in here, when we talk about progress, we always wind up relying on antibiotics, lives saved, gadgets in your pocket, all of these sort of technology things that, that we consider progress. But I think most of us down deep would rather think that scientific progress is not just increased technology, that that's not the only way to identify scientific progress. And so a deeper way to think of it, a deeper way to measure it, I think would be quite welcome. Thank you. I do, actually. Um, I'll try and get here, here, here. Um, that's OK. Um, OK, thank you. I, I wasn't able to catch uh, Miriam Solomon's talk yesterday, I guess, which is where she presumably defines sort of scope of bias, uh, funding bias in, in research and stuff like that. But I see that as definitely directly tied to the auxiliary NAS, uh, which she expressed terror, terror for which it's very clear to see. And I'm just wondering how you would um, sort of rate the current you know, internal institutions, the conglomerate of, of labs and scientists, the community itself, on its ability to, the, the difficulty of communicating you know, um, with the public about science and, and you know, that balance of trust, and, but also understanding uncertainty. Do you feel that um, there is a, um, that the level of concern within the community matches the level of threat from a, like, from, well, from the, the fear of, you know, mm. uh, science being fully politicized or just? Um, well, I, I mean, I, no, I, I personally think it would be better if everybody was a lot more worried about it because I think there's a lot more yeah, to worry about. You really see it as it is. Yes, but as you know, you know, we get kept busy with all sorts of things, and and then those things which which don't have easy solutions and and take a fair amount of energy um, get somehow or another and and happen incrementally. You know, these this came up and I tried to make a big deal out of it, but was actually told, well, the better thing is to just leave it be. I'm not, still not sure that's the right solution. So now I bring it up wherever I can just to, you know, after the fact. Um, I, it's also true, listen, I, you know, scientists are good scientists. That doesn't make them good at any other damn thing in the world. And they're already asked to do more things that they're not good at than they should be doing, including various administrative things, uh, reviewing things in some cases, promotions and tenure, teaching. I mean, they may be good at some of those things and not at others. And certainly communicating with the public is not something that many of them are likely to be good at or have an affinity for. Or political issues are, are not the kind of thing that many of them, I mean, how many scientists are in Congress? We live in an incredibly scientific culture, and yet it's virtually unrepresented in the political sphere, which seems strange to me, right? But So if you had to give a grade to the scientific community on how well, on their 
measures to optimize the connection with the public, what kind of grade would you give? Jeez, <laughs> never thought I'd be asked to grade anything here. <laughs> so let's think. Well, I, I mean, you know, I, I, w I couldn't give a grade to the community as a whole because I don't think the community as a whole is responsible to do anything or is going to do anything. So you can fail them or praise them, and it's not going to make any difference. I mean, I think that a few people have to take the lead in this. Um, and those people who find, you know, talking to the public or speaking to politicians, and there are more of them. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to say at least one of the trends among graduate students actually is at least <laughs> It's a kind of an unintended consequence. I'm not sure it's a good one, but the fact that there are so few jobs in academia or in laboratories, many graduate students have turned to politics and, and want to work in, in, uh, in policy and as either as staffers or put themselves up for election or things like that. So, I, and I guess I think that's good. I think that's a great idea for them if it's okay by them, if they find an interest in this. So a lot of them go into outreach and things of that nature. And that's to be applauded. Stuart. Thank you all very much. Thank you. All.